Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. So, um, again, I wanna welcome everyone to our presentation today, our webinar on behind the scenes, game-based learning success stories for critical business solutions with our presenters, Andrew Jolly and Paul Andrews. So I wanna introduce you to our presenters. Um, Andrew Jolly leads the strategy and consulting faculty and our learning experience team, which is at the front line of delivering creative, innovative, and effective learning solutions. And his colleague, Paul Andrews, is a senior learning experience designer with GP Strategies. And he began his career teaching mathematics and computer science and has a master's degree in adult education and e-learning. So gentlemen, welcome. I know you have a really great session planned today. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much. There's one great correction I can I can uh, make, which is that Paul is in fact a learning consultant uh, with our team um, fairly recently. So, and uh, congratulations to to you, Paul, for that. Um, very good to be here. <clears throat> As Kim said, uh, I lead the consulting faculty uh, in GP Learning Experience, but I've been uh, working in games for many, many years. In fact, uh, uh, I was uh, initially a games designer um, way back when we were creating games on, on the PlayStation. And in fact, before I moved into a learning, uh, a learning career. So uh, games and gamification have been uh, close by me all the way along. And it's been very exciting over those years to bring my knowledge of games and game design to um, the challenge of delivering great learning in business. I was about to introduce myself, I? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Paul Andrews. Um, and yeah, thank you to Andrew and Kim for the lovely introductions. Um, yeah, fresh fresh out of the factory learning consultants as well. Um, so my yeah, uh, previous experience, like, um, like Kim said, I used to be a math teacher um, and um, I've been a learning technologist for about 20 years. Um, and really over that time, I've combined my love and passion for predominantly video games um, in seeing how that they can be used to motivate people uh, to learn new things, particularly when it comes to things like simulations as well. So we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but yes, I'm very, very passionate in terms of how games and gamification can be used to motivate people to push themselves further. Thanks, Paul. So um, great to have you uh, with us um, this afternoon, this morning, uh, whatever time zone you're in. Um, over the next hour, Paul and I are going to uh, take you behind the scenes a little bit um, in, in our world of games and learning games. Um, we, we will start with what we're talking. We'll explain what we're talking about, what we mean um, by games and games for learning, and a little bit of uh, a moment to touch on when they are appropriate and you'll hear from us that we're very very uh, evangelical about games for learning um, and uh, we'll give you just a little bit of a summary of that we've got a our own secret source which we're going to be showing you today which is our own game design model and no better way than to show it and how it works than to show you some uh, case studies of games that um, you can see the model really working behind it. Uh, and it's a design model rather than a technology platform. Uh, so it'll work for any any game challenge that you you face. Um, and it's it'll be it, it's it's great model for uh, driving thinking and ideas and understanding when and how a game can work for you. Uh, and then if we have some time at the end, we'll just touch on where we think learning games are heading. Uh, and some of the future stuff. But uh, as Kim said, if you have any questions, if you have any Q&A type questions, put them in Q&A. Obviously, if you have any chat, stick it in chat. And we'll try and pick them up along, along the way. Um, so we're looking forward to uh, a kind of interactive session as much as possible. Uh, and here we go with that first interaction, which is really getting a feel for how you are and where you are in the world of games and the context. Um, it's great 
that over the last 15 years, I'd say, games have become a fully recognized component of the learning ecosystem, if you like, and of all the tools we have uh, at our disposal as those of us designing learning solutions in business. Um, but it's true to say that some organizations have uh, embraced the game type uh, design approach more than others. So great to uh, ask, be able to ask you this question and understand where you are. So the question which you've all answered, which is fabulous, uh, is do you use games as part of your learning strategy? Um, and we have 21%, um, well, let's just end the poll and then we can show you the results. Um, Fantastic. Hope you can see that. Um, so we have 20% saying yes, significantly, which is great. Um, and a similar amount saying not yet. Uh, hopefully by the end of today, those of you who've you, who have chosen the not yet will be um, out to find ways you can use games. Uh, and then 60% in the occasionally area, which is sort of what I'd expect. In fact, it's great that there are there are 20% of you using games significantly. Uh, so what we'll do is um, we'll be coming back to those of you who answered occasionally and not yet to ask you a couple of questions later on as to perhaps why. But we're going to um, move on forward. If I said to you, what, what are games all about? I think um, largely many people would say uh, games are all about play. Um, and that is the secret to why games work in a learning context in business. Play, and, and the secret to that is that play is about uh, a, a number of different modes of engagement uh, or learning modes, if you like. When we, when we play in any way, in any way um, we are experiencing and engaging with uh, others and ourselves and um, uh, the world using many different kind of modes of operation. So we're experimenting things, we're solving problems, we're creating things, we're quite often sharing. Uh, there are different modes of watching things happen and then reacting to them. We're trying things out. We're very often failing. Um, we're exploring, we're creating. Every one of these different modes here is another tool we use as learning designers to bring people uh, into modes of different behavior or understanding or knowledge um, uh, growth. And they're all implicit in, in, in games and play uh, to one extent or another, because every game that we create has different components of these at play, which is precisely really what we're talking about today. Um, and it's true to say that games and game game design are um, at the heart of everything. It, it is a creative and experiential human uh, engagement. And therefore, one thing that we often hear, that we often talk about, is that great learning games combine science and art. Um, and uh, I just wonder what, Paul, what your feeling is as an expert learning designer about that, getting that combination right between the two. It's absolutely crucial. Um, a lot of the time when people, I mean, many years ago when the, the, this was first coming up, people talked about serious games. And the, the term serious game got a bit of a bad rep um, because games are supposed to be, on, on some level, fun. Um, so it's about harnessing that art of play. So they've got to be engaging. And they don't have to be fun as in humorous, but they've got to be engaging and in... There is a science of play. Yes, there is. Um, so you've got a science of learning and a science of play. We'll call it the art of play for now, but you're quite right, Rick. Yeah. So we the, the idea is they've got to be engaging and enjoyable. That's that's the main thing. The, it's got to be enjoyable. Um, but also then combining or bringing on with that um, sound educational theory and applying that theory, in particular, when it comes to adult, adult learning, andragogy, applying that into the game itself. So you get this really nice blend of 
I'm hitting all of the things that adults need when they're trying to learn things, but also providing them with a an engaging and enjoyable experience. I wouldn't necessarily say fun because it depends on the topic, and we're going to look at some quite serious examples later. Uh, but engaging and enjoyable is are the two main um, things I'd say. Definitely, definitely. Now, um, what one of the things um, we're going to do in the next few minutes is show you three specific games. And what we didn't necessarily want to do is go through all the different myriad of game design types uh, and why they're useful. Um, however, we do have a PDF that we are going to release to you at the end of this webinar, um, which covers that. Um, but one thing we wanted to do, Paul and I, was just give you a quick sort of view of the kind of edges of what we're talking about um, and uh, so that you understand the kind of breadth of solution that we that we develop. Um, so for instance, one of the kind of key models that we'll be showing you we'll be showing you some of later uh, is a sort of strategic approach to games and games design. Um, these often involve uh, complex decision making, um, processes, challenges, bringing different skills together, perhaps analytic skills, um, and thinking around problems and so on and so on. So for instance, on the left there is a, a game we developed for a large um, uh, uh, food rate retailer, um, fast food chain, um, which is about uh, operating as a consultant, um, driving profitability of different restaurants. It's extremely complex uh, and difficult to play, but it absolutely suits the uh, the audience and the learning need. And on the right here is something we did for the oil industry, which is really all about uh, engaging with extracting oil and bringing it to, mar to market. So highly complex, probably um, very good for uh, explaining how, how businesses work and so on. So puzzle games. <laughs> right. Um, puzzle. You think puzzle games, uh, you might think of things like Tetris, for example, is probably the world's most famous puzzle game. Um, when we talk about using puddle puddle games puzzle games even uh in uh, in, in business um we're looking at um providing experiences that focus on enhancing problem solving skills and critical thinking skills a subset of this uh would be like a point and click adventure or an escape room type experience and these uh, and the main pitch you can see here uh, it's something we're going to be looking at a little bit later on. These are very, very popular with many of our clients. Um, the reason being is they allow um, the learner to be placed in an immersive environment, which can replicate their actual working environment or a, a, you know, a situation they might find themselves in. Or it could be something completely different, completely fantastical. But the idea is they can explore that immersive environment, pick up clues, learn things, and then encounter puzzles within that environment and try and solve those puzzles to you know complete the game. So, and, I, I, and again, um, a, a mainstream example of this might be something like The Secret of Monkey Island or a game like Myst. So the idea is you're exploring those environments, picking up clues, and then using your own knowledge with the clues you've gathered to solve various puzzles. So, thanks. Another another type of game that we develop a lot, and we've, we've got five of these. So this is the third of the five, just very, very quickly, are arcade type games. You will have seen these often. Um, they're great for uh, um, when the learning is effectively quite light, the fun factor is high, they're good for gamification solutions, they've got quite high stickiness and often involve scoring and competition and so on. So really good for sort of assessment quiz type things, product knowledge games we've created a lot, the one on the left is... Um, a very kind of modular product knowledge quiz game. So something that you see um, often, but really aren't very sort of profound in their design, if you like, but fun to play. Cool. What about these? Uh, simulations. I would I would probably say that these are our most popular game types um, purely because they allow our clients to provide their learners with realistic environments in which they can practice things and make mistakes and learn from their mistakes without risking injury, without risking damaged reputation, without risking uh, financial implications. 
So um, the, the, the simulation games can be very, very versatile because we can tailor them to any industry, any circumstance, any situation. Um, most importantly, and again, when it comes to adult learners, make them vocationally relevant uh, because many adult learners need to see the relevance and how it's going to how that learning experience is going to impact them in their job. So if you can, they can see that straight away by being immersed in a recognizable situation, um, we tend to find that works really, really well uh, with uh, with adult learners in our client base. So yeah, these are very popular. And and very closely connected are um, scenario type games. So um, these really uh, would focus more on people based interactions, decisions, uh, impact of decisions, connection between people, conversations, um, and are quite often realistic. Now, it's not to say that this example here we did um, how not to suck at money, which is um, a great a great game uh, doesn't look very realistic, but actually interactions you have with people with people are. Now, I know I've mentioned gamification and games. They are two subtly different things. So, um, Paul, do you want to just explain what we mean by each of these? Yes, um, I, I love this picture because I think it's a really nice visual representation of what we're talking about. Um, so we'll start with the one on the left first. So gamification, what's that? That is basically where you're trying to encourage specific behaviours or specific learning outcomes and enhance learner engagement by applying game-based design elements to your existing learning. So an example of that might be, if you complete this course, we're going to give you a badge. If you get so many badges, you get a prize. So and a real life example of that might be something like, you know, fitness trackers. If you do so many steps, you get a little reward. It's that kind of thing. It's, it's trying to motivate you to engage in something. Whereas a true game, the one on the right, sees this more blended swirled approach here. That is a fully fledged game designed and created specifically from the ground up to facilitate learning through the act of playing the game itself. So it's not kind of like some slides with some fancy graphics uh, and then a game it looks like a game they're actually learning by playing the game itself um <clears throat> and the latter is what we're going to be focusing on today when we're showing you our examples they are true games that have been developed by gp strategies for our clients that enhance that learning via the act of gameplay perfect so um, so we showed you a few of the game types, and believe me that there are many, many others that involve different components of those. Um, and um, I'm going to jump quickly to the model um, because we've got quite a lot to get through. Um, the, the, the challenge that we face as game designers is in any kind of situation where we're speaking with a customer, um, there are all of these possible directions that we could go in. But we've been making games for years and years and years. And there is effectively, we've codified a kind of model of engagement, which is enables us to hit the bullseye as quickly as possible when we are in a kind of that design mode. And when we're working, workshopping with clients, with subject matter experts, with business performance experts to develop a game that will work. Um, very, very broadly, and Paul's going to explain these three steps in a little bit more detail. Um, th these are these take us slowly from the, defining the core foundations, the design pillars of a game, through to what the key components might be that then allow us in step three to design uh, a core kind of gameplay loop. Um, we're not going to go into it in, in detail because, in fact, we're going to show it to you in practice. But, Paul, do you want to just give us a kind of quick outline of those three steps? Very, very quick overview. OK, so step one, what happens is when we start working with our clients, we listen to what the, you know, they want to achieve um, and we'll ask them key questions. And the idea is based on those answers that they give us, we will then create with them these design pillars. Um, so you can see the text around there. These are the kind of things we're looking for. Oh, I've got feedback. Uh, these are kind of things we're looking for. So we're asking the clients, you know, how do people win this game? What does, what does success look like? What do you want them to learn by playing the game? Does the game need to look a certain way? Does it need to follow brand guidelines, for example? So we create these pillars. And the important thing about these pillars is that every design decision we make after that is based on those pillars. 
which then leads us on to stage two, where we map the shape of the game out. So here we have 22 factors or levers that we can pull, and we score each of them uh, between zero and five based on what we're hearing from our clients. And, and you can see here some of them, so we'll be able to say things like, uh, do you want them to be fun? Do you want the, how long do you want the game to last? Uh, does it need to be strategic? So each of these get a score. And when we've scored them, we go on to the next slide, you'll see that the, there we go, that uh, this gives us the unique shape of um, the particular game. So this is almost like a fingerprint uh, for your particular game. So you can see here, Yes, please do feel free to ask questions. Uh, you can see here that in this particular example, we mapped a game out where the humor score, that's in the fun factor over on the right hand side in the pink, that's quite low. So this might be a quite a serious game, but the decision complexity in the orange is quite high. So we'd be this game would require learners to make decisions that are quite complicated. And so this base, the idea behind this is this will shape how players feel when they play the game, but it will also then directly determine how we design the story, the artwork, the mechanics, and the learning experience of, of that game. Which then moves us nicely onto the gameplay loop. Um, so the, what is a gameplay loop? Well, in game design, it is a repeatable sequence of actions that players engage throughout the game, and it for, forms the core learning experience. So the idea is, is that every single learning objective people have needs to be met by a gameplay activity. So they've got to learn by doing. So again, we bring this back to an example you might be familiar with, a gameplay loop, if we think about Pac-Man, for example. Now, Pac-Man isn't an educational game, not suggesting it is, but the gameplay loop in Pac-Man is eat pellets, avoid ghosts, have some power pellets, turn the ghosts blue so they'll run away and chase after them, collect some fruits to get extra points, and then clear all the levels. The, the same principle applies with this. It's that loop of what are people doing in that game, but when it comes to educational games is... Everything they do must be in service of one or more learning objectives. Perfect. Now, if that all seemed just a little bit complicated, I think the three case studies we're going to go through now will bring it to life somewhat, and you'll see you'll see it in action. Now, we did come out to um, to many of you to ask what case studies would be most um, appropriate or that you'd be interested in in looking at and the three top choices are the ones we're going to be doing today first one's uh, really focused on on onboarding into an organization second one's a global learning platform for a finance organization and the third one is is about complex decision making uh, and a scenario so uh, as i say if you have any questions around these case studies as we go through drop them into the chat or q a and we will try and pick them up if we have time as we go along or pick them up at the end. So um, first case study over to you, Paul. Tell us about it. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. So this first one here, uh, this was uh, for um, a company who wanted their employees, uh, particularly their new starters, to learn about their global business services. So this is like an induction program. Um, and when we met with them, uh, what they said, they came to us and said, ah, we've got a problem and we're doing this, but it's not very exciting. It's not very engaging. And so what we want is we want people to um, be excited by it, but also we want them to want to learn about our global business services. So again, we had those conversations with the client and it formed these pillars here. So they those form three, two large pillars that we had, and we had these other ones shown here. Um, once we'd mapped out those pillars, though, we then pulled those 22 levers and we got the shape of the game, which it looked to here. So you can see on this one again that you can see the humor was quite low. It's going to be quite a serious game. Um, in the engagement down on the bottom right, they wanted the game itself to last quite a long time. They wanted people to have quite a, a, a good a good amount of time playing the game. Um, but, and they also wanted it to be non-linear as well in the playability. So they wanted people to be able to go and explore and do various things. So we took all of that and this is what we came up with. Um, we came up with, so this is a screenshot from the actual game. And the idea was, is the learners were given several towers that they had to explore. So they go into each of these towers and each tower contained multiple rooms. 
If we go on to the next slide, have a, there you go. So there's a screenshot of one of the rooms and the rooms all had things in them that the learners could click on to discover. Either they might find a bit of information or they might find a puzzle. And the next slide will show, uh, I think we go, one of the puzzles in one of the rooms. And you'll see here, there's these funny little icons. It says, what does data? And there's a symbol involved. The idea behind the game was that learners had to explore and discover these symbols and then they had to work out what each of those symbols meant either from their own pre-existing knowledge or by piecing together clues they found throughout the game as they did this we had a self-populating dictionary here or directory rather um, which would tick off the symbols that they discovered and what they meant the idea being is they want to fill it out this directory to discover all the symbols to be able to solve the game. And to solve the game, you have to use the symbols to decipher or decode this message. So that was the idea behind the game. Um, it proved to be really, really popular. The engagement on this one was very, very high. I think um, we had something like uh, an 82 percent uh, engagement level, which is very, very high. Um, but yeah, and as a result of this, the client uh, has come back to us this year and has asked us to up, like, create another version of this game for them because they, they, it hit really, really well with their with their target audience. I think this is really nice because um, you're probably thinking it looks quite challenging. And in fact, it was. But that's what really worked about it. You had to think, what do these words, what do these symbols mean and make sense of of the statements and the context that you were seeing these in. And actually, once you got the gist of it, it it really kind of worked very, very well. And it meant that you had to think hard about um, what the organization was doing and the key principles and foundations of this organization. So it was really nice. And I think sometimes people, we're in danger of making games that are uh, not challenging enough and I think um, our learners really appreciate it when when we give them things that uh, that get them really thinking and trying hard. Um, so if you have any questions for Paul, particularly about that one, stick them in the chat or in Q and A. But we're very happy to come to come back to those. Um, although I would say, if there's something Paul that we could take from this. Um, one specific thing that this is a good exemplar of, you know, is there something that comes to mind? Um, I think the main thing here it it was having a certain amount of faith in the in in the learners as well because there were there, there were concerns that it was going to be too complicated, um, but we designed it in such a way that there was like a tutorial so it walked people through it. Um, and actually, like you say, Andrew, the second they they got the cons, they they found the first symbol. Everything else kind of clicked into place, and then there was this kind of race to find out what all the other symbols were. They understood the, what the assignment was, um, and they they the feedback was they really really enjoyed it um, mm. because because it involved them thinking, uh, and, and it, the information wasn't just kind of like served up to them. They had to actually decipher it but yeah i think it's about knowing your audience as well um and having having faith in them they can uh, play games like this brilliant great okay well we'll move on to the next um the next case study we have which was a uh, a, a game we produced for visa now i'd say to say it as a game is is perhaps even doing it down because effectively it was a it was a gamified learning platform, really, within the organization. Um, the challenge that we uh, were engaging with was um, Visa, like many organizations, financial technology organizations, have a huge number of products. Uh, in actual fact, you know, many hundreds of different products that their account execs are responsible for selling and packaging to solve the problems of their customers. Um, and they very often are specialists in their area of product or their family of products. An account executive will know one area really well, but will not be so familiar with the other products and therefore are missing an opportunity to sell them to their customers. So the real challenge here was create a game 
that our learners can come back to time and time again, that provides a portal to learning about hundreds of different products and awareness around them, and then tests their ability to sell them to different customers. Um, and the design pillars here were connecting all of the different products in Visa together um, in a meaningful way to the, to the players, um, to create a platform that was a kind of destination platform that had come back to and play again and again. This idea of step in, step out. So step into game mode, play the game, step out to learning mode to learn about product. And as a result, this is really a gamified solution. Um, it's a wrapper to some e-learning, some of which existed and much of which we created, but it, it's a kind of, um, it is a perfect game, gamified um, example. Um, it needed to be challenging and it also needed to be rewarding. The account executives are triggered by competition and score and being at the top of leaderboards and so on and so on. So this was the game shape we developed. Um, picking out a couple of those things, um, you'll see at the top right there, high in teaching. So as I say, it's a gamified solution. So um, there, were, there was e-learning embedded in here. So there was quite a lot of teach, um, but there was also uh, decision-making and putting that knowledge into, into practice. It was a pretty low humor. Um, um, no, no, no real team working here. Uh, I think we might have a, a talk about team working and multiplayer later. Um, but uh, it was it was a game you play on your own very much. Um, low metaphor. You know, this is a game about selling uh, financial products to a customer. Um, one thing to say down here is number of sessions five. So the the customer. That Visa wanted us to develop a game that people would come back to time after time after time for perhaps short periods of time, play it maybe once a week, but come back to it. Um, and it had sort of great replayability um, as well. So what did that look like? So as I said, there were hundreds of, of, of products here that we were, we were working with. So each product had its kind of train line. The first thing learners had to do was to collect the different stations on their particular train line, their product line, and do it. To do that, they they go to they choose that product um, family, and can either do open learning or challenges associated with it. Now, I haven't got the open learning here to show you, but it, effectively, you know, you know what goody learning looks like. It was they were short micro learns around each of these products. Um, and when they had collected a whole a line, if you like, and they got a tick for this product family, they could start, they could add it to their, their portfolio and start to try and sell those products to their customers. Um, so they would then go into a client proposal mode, choose a customer and look at what the customer needed and choose which products to sell to them. Um, that would involve questions that they would have um, written in text and they could choose questions and answers uh, and engage with their customer. Um, there were a lot of um, variables in here around those scenarios, but um, and a lot of uh, rewards and badges and celebrations, which we knew this particular audience would really, really um, uh, enjoy and react to. Um, and the net result was a growing, um, a growing learning platform, hugely successful with the account executives uh, at Visa. And you know, one of the facts that I really was happy to to see after um, six months of it um, being released into the organisation was that those that played the game were delivering three times the number of sales opportunities. Um, now, you know correlation and causation uh there's a question there you know did they were they really good at the game because they were really good salespeople, or what or or were they inspired to sell i'd like to think very much that it was the latter um and we'll be diving into into more of those statistics as well but um it was a, a huge project and very ambitious but um 
deeply successful in that combination of learning and and uh, and playing. So over to you, Paul. Example three. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Out, outbreak response. Um, I I adore this guy. I think it's brilliant. This one. Um, this was we had a, a large international health body approach us, um, and they 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 knew they wanted a game. Um, they but they they wanted a game that so it had to be a very serious game because it was all about teaching people how to they can manage a health crisis in a developing part of the world um so this game originally uh they came to us i think it was uh, at the height of the covid19 pandemic um and so they wanted something that would be engaging um because they couldn't get people physically into uh, buildings and training centers um and they wanted it to be um, it, something innovative uh, as well because they were finding their traditional ways of doing things weren't really working that well uh because of the pandemic they just couldn't get people in um so we sat down with them we had the conversations and we came up with these design pillars here uh which should be there we go um and so you can see the design pillars listed there um the the the, the one i kind of call out on that one uh there really well there's two actually number two uh that the game had to be decision focused uh, and number four, because it kind of go hands in hand, that the 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 game experience had to be immersive and believable. So this kind of tracks back to what we were saying earlier about simulations and allowing people to practice real world situations, but in a safe space. Um, so we did that, had these design pillars. We came up with the shape of the game. Um, and again, you can see here, it looks a little bit different to the other ones. Uh, the, the metaphor and the humor are non-existent because this was a very serious uh, topic. It still had to be engaging, but it was a very, very serious topic. They didn't want it to teach, uh, so the teaching is quite low, but what they did want learners to have was a high decision frequency. So you're making decisions as you're playing this game and they wanted those decisions to be complicated. They also wanted the learners to feel a sense of pressure uh, when making these decisions because that was uh, a simulation of what would actually happen in the real world. So this is the game we we designed and we built for them. Um, it's uh, you basically the, the player uh, sets off. It's, it's set in a fictional country uh, where there has been a pathogen outbreak. Um, and the overall aim of the game, the player has to determine the nature of that pathogen outbreak. So what happens? Just go on to the next slide. Here we go. So um, you start off at the base camp. You have a map and you can explore various different locations within the within the country, within the region. Um, <clears throat> and so the idea is you're trying to reduce the infection rate and you're trying to discover the source of the pathogen. Now, to do this, um, you have you're given uh, tasks uh, in, in a journal here. So you've got your primary and secondary objectives. So you have to decide which objectives you're going to focus on because you can't do them all. And then you have to use that map we just looked at previously to travel to those locations and interact with various characters to build up your reputation, to build up your level of trust because you are a stranger in a strange land, to quote the song. OK, um, the main point of the game, though, if we go on to the last screen, is do you have to, to complete the game? You have to convince one of the village elders to cancel a festival which has huge cultural significance within the region. So the idea is you, you, you explore the areas, you build up the levels of trust, you build up your reputation, and then the final part of the game is can you convince the village elder that actually it's in the best interests of everyone in the region not to have the planned face-to-face -face festival and risk people becoming poorly as a result. The game itself, so after you after you complete each day, you get kind of reports on how well you did. But the game itself ends on a cliffhanger. And the reason for this is the client actually said to us, Do you know what, we want this to be part one. And we want, uh, again, a bit like if you've ever uh, seen things like um, tell the Telltale Games, they'll do this, things like The Walking Dead. They'll do episode one and then wait for a bit and episode two. And that builds up that level of anticipation. So the level of engagement when episode two comes around is really, really high. Our particular client is adopting the same approach with this. So we've done episode one, we've left it on a cliffhanger, and episode two will be rolling out shortly. Um, 
I think it's a, it's a this is a really visually very um rich game um and I know that you say it's very serious but it's mm. deep kind of um immersive in a real sense when you play it what I do like is um that this slide here really um uh ex ex exemplifies nicely is this idea of comparing your responses at the end of the day with the other players responses so even though you're it's not a multiplayer game there is this sort of element of well i'm doing this um as part of a massive cohort and i can i can see how well i did compared to the other people which is a kind of big component of of play as well and sometimes for various reasons um either we don't design multiplayer or it's not possible for technology or budget or whatever reasons um but to build in things like this which allow you to consider how you are behaving compared to others and how your decision making um worked out compared to others is really interesting um what what it makes me ask you paul is the role of of failure in learning games because um we've i think in this case where there's not that much teaching as you say it was about decision making yes. um where where does failure play a role in the design here um it it's about saying to people that it's okay to fail because obviously this is it's 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 a safe it's a it, it's a safe simulation and and to be honest most people if you think about most of the things you've encountered in your life most of the time you've learned something through failure it might have been you failed your first driving test for example and you think i know why i failed i won't do that again most adults tend to learn through failure um so what we trying to we were trying to harness that by saying you'll remember the failures and you'll remember the reasons why you failed and you'll carry that with you. And the idea is then is in reality, if you're faced with a situation in real life that mirrors something you've experienced with these simulations, you'll be able to go, oh, hang on a second, I, I, I did this and I made this decision in the simulation and that didn't work out. So let's avoid that. So by allowing people to fail in a safe, in a safe way here, it's almost like saying to them, well, it allows you to spot the potential potholes in the road. So when you encounter them in real life, you can move around them. You can successfully navigate them. Um, and that's part of the power of using games for teaching and learning. It, it gives people the opportunity to fail, but learn from it, pick themselves up, dust themselves down and have another go. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Now we have got a couple of questions um, that come in. Uh, one is from Rick. Uh, I think this it references the visa game the financial training platform um so rick says how did the same people uh presumably learn in sales before they played this game um well this is really interesting because before we developed the game they did have a lot of product knowledge materials and they had quite a lot of e-learning but they were all in different places um, I think they did some face to face as well. Um, so there was a level of cons there was a lack of, of of consistency around the different learning uh, around all the different products in, in in Visa at the time. So one of the the things that we did by creating this platform was say, right, we're going to take the best of the best of the digital learning, um, tighten it up and, and embed it into this game. Um, but people weren't doing the learning they weren't going to the digital learning uh the account executives in visa are people like almost everybody with very uh low uh amounts of time to give to this kind of thing and they just weren't engaging so part of the important role that the the the, the um inside track game had to play was to um drive people into the learning itself um, by giving them the challenges and scenarios. And they didn't have those before at all. So the learning was very much fact, 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 fact about the different products. Whereas what we were creating is um, a route into that stuff, but then, right, can you apply that stuff? 
can you apply your knowledge of the different products uh, and actually sell something to uh, these virtual customers? Um, and then we had another question from Jill. Uh, have you ever linked gamification to traditional operator training simulation applications, e.g. control room or field operator training? Um, I've certainly seen such things. Um, I'm trying to think where we've done that. Where uh, That sounds to me like a kind of step in, step out solution as well, where you might have um, operator training simulations, microloans or packages of um, what you might call technical training, and then gamify that. So perhaps the result would be, and I'm sure I've seen versions of this that we've done, where the more you do, you collect points for doing the learning, for answering questions right, so on and so on, and that takes you up a leaderboard or gives you some uh, uh, opening into new levels. We'll, we'll touch on this a little bit later on, but um, we, we've done it um, with VR and AR, sorry, virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, must have used an acronyms. Uh, but so, so the answer to the question is yes, we have. Um, but um, when we're doing training simulations, obviously the level of immersion has to be that much higher because it's got to be a one-to-one -one replication of the equipment they're going to be using. So yes, we have, uh, but we tend to work with clients and suggest they they go down on a, a, an augmented reality or a virtual reality route with that so that we can replicate it on a one-to-one -one basis. Great. Um, we've got another question. I'm going to save that um, for the end. Uh, and we, I have, we have a question for you. Um, so our question for you, and please put your answer into answers into chat, um, just to see if any of all of this we've been talking about has triggered um, some thoughts in you. Um, where could a game work for a learning challenge that you're familiar with? Um, so has has anything that you've seen today um, given you a, a, a moment of thought where you go, oh, yes, right, this is a learning challenge we have. I can now see how we could engage with it using a learning game. So if you have any of that, put it into the, the chat here. Um, meanwhile, I will answer this um, other question while anybody thinks about possible uses of games. Um, and the question from SP is, from Sharon, what kind of data is exportable from games? Paul, is this a question you can answer? Uh, yes. Um, well, it, the answer is it depends on the platform that you're using to develop your game on. Um, so, for example, uh, if your game is built on a platform such as Gomo or Storyline, um, then it's SCORM compliant. So you can extract any of the information you'd be able to get from a traditional e-learn. So things like learner progression, uh, test scores they've got, things like that. Um, Obviously, if you were using a different uh, platform for your games, then it would the information you can get would depend on the platform that you were talking about. Um, if you were creating a game from scratch, if you're coding it, um, then of course you can do anything you want because the second you get into programming, you can tell your game to export anything, any variable, any data value you like uh, as text files, or it can send things to your servers. So. So I can't really give you a straight answer, but I can say that if, if the platform is something like Storyline or Gomo, then it would be SCORM compliant. And so it would it would then pass that information onto your um, learning management system. Does that answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks. And we do have uh, a response to the question. Um, a suitable fit for gamified learning can be uh, could be a, a very busy operational nature of work where the workers have little time from routine work. So you have a very short inter intervention that doesn't interfere with the business of the business. Yeah, yeah. This kind of um, do something little and often in the flow of work uh, is really good. You know, we are seeing... Um, I don't want to be taking any thunder from Paul's uh, 
next bit about future but the idea of the kind of tamagotchi kind of games keeping something going um you know a garden that you are um you're cultivating a digital garden and in order to cultivate it you need to go in every day and do one small thing that gives you water and fertilizer for your garden or whatever whatever is just really nice so um um yeah those little little and often that, that don't take you out of your routine work too much um you don't have to commit to a whole you know 45 minutes of an hour playing something but you can just learn uh, much more in the flow of work is really nice so um please come back with any other ideas oh we have one from vivek atomic interventions on a daily basis leading to addictive gamified habit yeah this like atomic yeah, these lovely little small interventions really nice really nice so um we did say we talked to you a little bit about where we think games are going um so in the last few minutes um paul do you want to tell us what your thoughts are on this yeah okay um so We've got three, um, the main ones. The first we've got is community building. Um, the idea is that he wants to build something called a community of practice. Um, there are two types of communities you can generally get. You've got communities of interest, which is a group of people that are interested in something. Let's say cake, for example. And they go, I like cake. Do you like cake? We all love cake. That's great. A community of practice, though, will talk about how you bake that cake. How do you make really nice cakes? Are you interested in things or are we doing things? So what we what we can see here is that you can use gameplay and game mechanics to bring people together to collaboratively solve challenges. And again, a real world example of this might be something like World of Warcraft, where people will come together and they will all group as a big group and they will go into a dungeon to fight a big boss and everyone will have different roles. Or Call of Duty, for example, where people will say, well, I will take, I will go around this way, you again this way, and we'll kind of have them up in a pincer movement. But the idea is people are working together to solve a challenge that the game presents to them. So the idea is we, we take that notion and we bring it into educational games to give teams of people the ability to contribute. In education, this is being used quite a lot as well with things like Minecraft. Uh, where you can say to your class, we're all going to be on the same server, you're all going to work together, and we want you to solve a particular challenge or build a particular thing. So that's the first one. The second one uh, we see is AI. Uh, <laughs> you can't go to any workshop these days that someone mentioned in AI. It's, it's, it's the law. Um, so basically, um, but the idea behind this is, is what we're seeing is that um, we will be able to have AI powered non-player characters or NPCs for short, which will add to that level of immersion. So at the moment, uh, what you might find is that your, your non-player characters, so these are the people that, that players meet in the game controlled by the computer, it's all tightly scripted. Whereas if you, if you power it with an AI platform, um, then the responses that it can give can be much, much more uh, natural. And again, we're seeing this right now. There are mods for games like Skyrim and Fallout where the non-player characters are being powered by things like ChatGPT. So you can actually walk up to them and have a conversation about anything you want. And it's all powered by the AI. It's, it's really, there are YouTube videos on it. Go and have a look if you're interested. But it's the potential is huge for what we could do with this because we could focus it and have a subject matter expert powered by AI in a virtual environment that could help and advise and support people with whatever it is they're trying to learn. And then the last one, and again, we kind of touched upon this already, this idea of the continuous engagement. Um, so the idea is, is any place, anytime, anywhere. So it's not so much about the platform. Uh, it, you, the idea is you can access the game on any platform. So it could be if we're doing a simulation, yeah, absolutely, you have a headset on. But equally, if you've only got a couple of minutes, like we talked about earlier, then you can access that same simulation very quickly on your mobile phone to do a couple of things. Okay, it's not as immersive because you haven't got the headset on, but it is immediate and it allows you to fit it in with your routine. So truly platform agnostic um, games that so will work on pretty much anything you like. And my okay. computer is beeping at me, so it needs to be quiet. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, um, we've had um, we've had a few questions. Uh, I've got one that's come in um, before we before we finish up, um, and, and that is 
you know, really around um, tips for develop for developing and designing games. You know, what for for, for success um, in production. And and I mean, I I have one answer to that, and I'm sure we could we could do a whole hour on on this. Um, but having been through the the process that we dis we've shown you today um, many times. Um, the key lesson I have is uh, keep it simple. It is easy, very easy, to design a game that gets more and more and more complicated. Um, and actually, the, the, the trick and the reason that those three examples we showed you today really, really work and have been successful is that at the end of the day, they are relatively simple. They're quick to understand. You don't need a manual. You learn how to play very fast, and they're and they're simple to engage with. Um, so that would be my number one takeaway. And I don't know if you have any Paul that come to mind. Oh, uh, number one, I think is probably understand your audience. Um, I think it's um, not all games are suitable for all people and for all workplace cultures. Um, so it's about understanding your audience and knowing and almost reading the room, knowing what's going to work and what isn't work. If you're not sure, talk to people, ask them, um, see what they think. Um, when it comes to the actual game itself, uh, it's always a good idea um, to have a clear idea in your head about what you want to achieve with the game. So you you might not know, you know, what it's going to look like. You might not know how it's going to operate. But knowing, you know, why are we doing this? What do you, what do we want people to learn? Um, is 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 the most important because that's why you're doing it. You want people to learn things, so it's having that clear idea in your head of what do we want people to learn, and if possible, how do we want them to learn it. So when they close the laptop, take the headset off, shut the mobile phone down, what new knowledge and skills have they got up here that they can apply to make your workplace better? Perfect. Okay. Well, I see Kim here, and uh, we've hit the top of the hour. So from me, thank you very much, everybody, for coming and um um i do want to interrupt you for one second we you said you're going to share a pdf do you want me to share that pdf with everyone oh, yes. now yes please kim thank okay, you very i will much. put that link in the chat so if you're as you're on uh go grab that link and check out that pdf it is a good one so i'm sorry andrew you can continue no i was just going to say thank you very much well thank you to kim Thank you, everybody, for coming. And um, it's been lovely spending a bit of time with everybody. Great. Yeah, I you. want to thank you both. Oh, sorry, Paul. Did you want no, to? No, I can say thank you so much. It's been great. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, I want to thank not only you, the presenters, for your time, but also for everybody on the call today for your time and attention. So do we do ask at the end of the session, if you take just one minute and fill out our survey, we really do appreciate your feedback and we take it into consideration when we're creating our upcoming webinars. I hope you'll join us again for another upcoming webinar. Be sure to visit GP Strategies website to view future sessions. And I wish everyone on the session a wonderful and productive rest of your day. Cheers, everyone. This webinar was brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we help organizations transform through their people. You can access more webinars or download additional resources by visiting the GP Strategies Resource Library. The link is on your screen and in the description.